Good afternoon, comrades. This is a brief report on my visit to Venezuela in the Venezuelan elections last week. It's intended to accompany an article that I've written and will be published soon on Almayadeen called Five Myths About the Venezuelan Election. Because as you know, there's a huge media war, a psychological war going on now about Venezuela, as there has been for 25 years, really. Um, I was one of more than a thousand invited uh, foreign observers, Veadores, and we were located in four hotels. They showed us around the city. Uh, we attended some seminars with the Instituto Simon Bolivar. Uh, we went to a very large rally for President Maduro. We um, went to the polling centers and uh, there was a briefing from the electoral, the, the, the CNE, the, the electoral council to explain how the system worked and the background to it, the basis of the CNE in the constitution, in the electoral law of 2009, the independence, the separate power uh, within the state of the, the electoral power. And we observed the, the polling on the 28th. Um, all in the lead up to the in uh, towards the end of the campaigning and the lead up to the election, the day of the election was all very peaceful. The violence, the conflict began the day after, and it was planned that way because for at least ten days the opposition had been saying, anticipating fraud. Basically, they were going to cry fraud. Uh, you know, there's sort of two currents uh, amongst the opposition. One participates, and sometimes they make some gains. They're still. Uh, sometimes mayors, governors of some states. You've got Manuel Rosales in Zulia, for example, uh, Enrique Capriles, who was governor of Miranda for two terms. So some of the opposition has accepted the institutionality of the Venezuelan system, and some of them are simply uh, addicted to this idea of a coup culture and linked to the US doing something. That's what's happened, unfortunately. Now, the US just as they tried to support this puppet Juan Guaido for four or five years, now they've decided that they are the arbiters of the election and not the, the the National Electoral Council, and they will decide who the president of Venezuela is. Of course, a complete uh, violation of all international norms. Um, I think within Venezuela, um, it's very clear with the the results of the elections now and the confidence that's widely shared in the Electoral Council, despite what you may read, read in the Western media, the position of uh, the re-election of President Maduro is very secure. He's supported by the Electoral Council. He's supported by the National Assembly. He's supported by the military. Um, there are very large, have been very large rallies before and after the elections and the the rallies for the official party and President Maduro are much bigger than those for the opposition. So internally, there's a very strong position, of course. Externally, in a sense, there's a reversion to the Juan Guaido era, more or less, where the US is saying, we don't believe these elections. We uh, are going to appoint our man, Edmundo Gonzalez, who was a CIA agent who was involved in the death squads, uh, organising the death squads in El Salvador in the 1980s and uh, backed by his partner in crime, Maria Corina Machado, who herself has been a paid agent of the US for many, many years. They have the strategy to say, we will participate, um, but on the basis of um, paid polling companies, most of them paid by the US and with very dodgy methods, um, predicted that their man, Edmundo Gonzalez, was going to win. And if he didn't, they would they would cry fraud, basically. And that's basically what happened. So the ongoing polemic, I guess, is more external than internal to, um, to the country there. I wrote this article, Five Myths on the Venezuelan Elections, to try and bring together some materials in case people want to use it to engage in arguments with people who want to persist in saying that there can't be a democracy in a country like Venezuela unless it has the approval, the seal of approval from Washington. Of course, that's the first myth, really, that Washington is an honest broker. And I point out in my article that as far back as the late 19th century, Jose Marti in Cuba was saying, talking about the, the uh, aim of the US before the so-called Spanish-American War to provoke a war, to have a pretext to intervene in Cuba, to steal independence from the Cuban freedom fighters and to assert themselves as a mediator and guarant guarantor so that they could take control of the country and of the other Spanish territories in the Caribbean. 
And Mark, he said, there is no more cowardly thing in the annals of free people, nor such cold-blooded evil. And ever since then, you know, for the last century, there have been dozens of US interventions in Latin America in particular, mainly to seize resources or change nationalist governments that are not fully in accord with US regional interests. Well, in, in Venezuela, there's been uh, several coup attempts since the 1998 Bolivarian Revolution which aimed to restore sovereign control over oil resources. Uh, you recall the 2002 coup attempt um, under Trump. There was a 19, 2019, 2020 failed coup attempt. And then, of course, these um, unilateral coercive measures, so-called sanctions by the Obama regime, by the Trump regime, which did a lot of damage to Venezuela's economy. But fortunately, the last three years, there's been some substantial economic recovery, and that made the environment somewhat better for um, Nicolas Maduro, because as of course, as we know, people will always blame bad economic conditions on the government, even when they know that there's other important factors involved. So there is a recovery. Most people in Venezuela, according to polls earlier this year, 82% of Venezuelans saw things getting better this year. And that was a help to the very well-organized campaign by the the PSUV and the, and the, the Polo Patriotico, the, the coalition of about 10 or 12 parties that supported the presidential campaign of Nicolas Maduro. So, of course, that history with which many of you will be familiar is enough to demonstrate that Washington can never be considered an independent arbiter or a mediator, an honest broker in anywhere in Latin America, in Venezuela in particular, where Venezuela historically for a century was the main source of fuel for the US war machine. Through world wars, through many, many uh, decades, um, Venezuela was the guaranteed source of oil. And of course, Venezuela continued selling oil to the US until um, the US under Trump decided to steal the Citgo operation and to block any further transactions. Fortunately, we're in a world today with partners like China and Russia and Iran and uh, some Latin American states to that uh, Venezuela can resume its economic relations without depending entirely on uh, a so-called US market. The second myth is doesn't a Maduro dictatorship control the electoral system? And I've set out under this head um, the independent electoral power that's embodied in the 1999 constitution, uh, reinforced by the electoral law from 2009, which has the electoral commission being appointed by the National Assembly or the Supreme Court. So it's not directly under control of the, uh, the executive or president uh, Maduro, for example. On top of that, the mechanized voting system, which has a history for some decades in Venezuela, but has improved in recent times, um, has built in security and audit system. It's a biometric system which uh, uses a thumbprint linked to um, uh, ID, ID numbers and so on it's, that are recorded. And that system was praised by former US President Jimmy Carter back in 2013. He said, Venezuela has probably the most excellent voting system that I have ever known. Now, since then, the Carter Center, minus its founder, has reverted to the standard Washington line. So if you look at the Carter Center these days, they're saying that they're, they're singing the same tune as the as the Secretary of State Blinken, that the results of the CNE could not be credible because it hadn't been published. Um, the full uh, data was not published. And that's where what the, the mantra of fraud bases itself in most of the Western media, you say, talking about fraud are saying, we can't check this because it should all be all of the details should be published. Now, that's based on a false premise, basically, because under the law, the CNE does indeed have to publish it within 30 days, within 30 days. The Carter Center, Blinken, was saying this within two or three days that we want to see all the data. And the opposition was saying, here, we've got some of the data. They publish it on their website, set up the day before the election in Virginia, down the road from Langley, Virginia, where the CIA is. They have a... a um, they've they published these, um, what they say are some of the uh, outcomes from some of the voting centres, but really um, it hasn't been fully published yet by the CNE. In the US, of course, there is no national electoral uh, body at all. It's done by the states there, and uh, the results are published about two months after in January, and January the 6th, the last one uh, in the US, two months after the election. So there's no uh, there's no state on earth really that publishes full data within two or three days. That's just a, an unrealistic thing that they're using as a type of propaganda mantra there. Um, all sides recognise there was very strong participation in this election, about 60%. Um, Blinken's accepted that. 
that's the CNA data too. About 60% of the registered population voted this time. There was a high level of participation. Um, so the CNA issued its initial res um, result for Maduro, 51.2% for Maduro after 80% of the votes had been counted. And a second report on the 2nd of August after 96.87 had been counted. And that second report gave Maduro almost 52%, 51.95%, 6.4 million votes as against 43.18 or 5.3 million votes for Gonzalez. Those results came despite massive informatic attacks on the CNA infrastructure. There were hacking attacks, uh, which have now been referred to the Supreme Court and terrorist attacks on the CNA offices and the burning of some centres of voting also. Um, so uh, the US system is far inferior to this system of voting there. And even some of the even some of the right wing uh, experts who were reported on MSN, the US acknowledged that there was a very strong, robust system with with security and with audits uh, built in so that uh, errors could be checked. Now, also pre poll, um, there's been a part of the media war was all these independent polls were predicting the defeat of Maduro. If you'd read the Western media, you would have seen these alarming polls saying Maduro had less than 20% support. Somehow this guy, Edmundo Gonzalez, who was not even known to half the Venezuelan population as at April this year, because he's been out of the political scene for some time. He's 75 years old. He wasn't known in the way that Maria Corina Machado was known, for example, or Juan Guaido. Um, nevertheless, there were these... Uh, polls that were being cited and they were linked and some of them were linked to the CIA and some of them were funded by the US. We don't know all the detail. of I don't know all the detail of that yet. But uh, the, the US media was running lines like this is Venezuela's moment. It needs the world's help. Uh, the CNN was falsely accusing Maduro of threatening a bloodbath if he didn't win. In fact, he was referring to the planned opposition tactics the day after the election, which in fact happened. Uh, and of course, there's been 25 years of such golpista violence in Venezuela. Uh, Maduro denounced the media disinformation, saying he was trying to prevent a war and that the US-backed opposition wanted to convert the country into a neoliberal disaster like Ar Argentina under Millet. Uh, CNN was arguing the election was a chance to rebuild Venezuela's economic power, while the Financial Times claimed that the polls were showing a crushing defeat was coming for Maduro if there were a clean vote. Now, the opposition didn't announce its... Um, platform, it's clear intentions, but it was very clear when you look a little bit more deeply into it, it was the same old, same old privatization of all the state assets, dismantling of the social security system, in particular, the the the, the Patria card, which is really now the a very clean way of um, uh, assuring subsidies in goods and services to individuals through their through their ID cards. So the polls that were weaponized in the lead up to the elections were the ones that were cited by the US media were Data Analysis, Delfos, Consultores, Pentayuno, and ORC Consultores. And that created this narrative that Gonzalez was going to win um, uh, 20 or 30 points ahead in public opinion of Maduro. And so Nicolas Maduro could only win by fraud. Um, however, if you looked at the Interlaces, Parametrica, and Ambito polls, they predicted pretty much what the CNE would announce in the early hours of 29th of July. Ambito in July had Maduro winning with between 51.7 and 71% of the vote, with Gonzalez between 20 and 24. Parametrica had Maduro on 51.74, also Gonzalez on 29%. On participation, they, they said about 68% would turn out. Interlasis in June had President Maduro leading with 55.6%, with Gonzalez on 22%. So there was this war of exit polls also during the elections themselves, supposedly illegal under electoral law, but nevertheless, there were exit, um, exit polls of Boca de Urna, uh, of people coming out of the polling station and being interviewed on coming out. Now, Interlasis gave Maduro 54.6% and Gonzalez 42.5% at midday, while the US-oriented meta-analysis gave Gonzalez 65.8% at 3 p.m. So there was there was this war of none of those... None of those um, uh, exit polls or uh, were conclusive, basically. The US government notoriously has funded media and poll bodies to suit its ends. For example, the International Republican Institute, the IRI, 
uh, with money from the National Endowment for Democracy back in 2012, used snowball polls in 2012 to suggest that internal Syrian support for armed intervention in Syria during that attempted colour revolution in Syria. Now, those snowball polls are deeply biased. They start with friends and move to friends of friends. They've got no representative validity at all. But that's the sort of thing that US funded bodies have done over years when they want to get the illusion of some sort of popular support for um, their particular aims. Uh, there was um, one exception in this media war, an interview on MSN where conservative lawyer and international consultant Egli Gonzalez Lobato, uh, a lawyer, acknowledged that Maduro could win without electoral fraud. Venezuela's electoral system is quite robust, she said, leaving enough traces for automation experts to detect any errors. So there was a couple of gaps, but by and large, you won't really see that in the reports of the Western media. They're all saying pretty much the same thing. All of the 10 candidates except Edmundo Gonzalez signed a statement saying they would accept the Electoral Commission's result. Um, but the Uni his united platform, it seems, was determined to not recognise any results unless they won. So they expected defeat and they were crying fraud well before the election, 10 days before they, they announced that there was going to be a fraud. Um, the, uh, as I said, I was one of more than 1,000 international guests called to observe the elections. Um, most of them reported favourably in groups and individuals on the general climate in the lead up to and during the elections, on the integrity of the voting process itself. The Venezuelan government did not allow in observers those who had attacked the country, such as EU, a EU delegation, which had backed the illegal US economic siege measures against the country. But nevertheless, if you look at reports now, Washington and the BBC report that anonymous international observers had condemned the election. That was very misleading. And I've cited in my article some very favourable and free and fair reports from Chilean observers, from South African observers. There are others from the Caribbean, from Africa. So there are quite a lot of uh, reports from those thousand of us who were there um, uh, uh, observing and writing and on social media and more general media. The fourth myth is, it doesn't Maduro bar his opponents from running for election? Well, really, the US sources often say that Maduro is personally doing this through executive power. Uh, in reality, the disqualifications now and in the past have been done by law, not by executive order. In the past, for example, some right-wing opposition figures have been disqualified for very serious crimes. Leopoldo Lopez, for example, was convicted in 2014, sentenced to a long prison term for public incitement, criminal conspiracy and inciting arson and criminal damage to do with the Guarimbas, the roadblocks where many people were killed. The US media, however, presented him as a freedom fighter. He was released from jail really on, on, on political pardon terms early in 2017. In the case of Maria Corina Machado, who was really the opposition leader with Edmundo Gonzalez, her front man, but she was disqualified this year. And the reported reasons for her disqualification included decisions of the Supreme Court that one, she supported US unilateral sanctions, um, uh, economic coercive measures. She'd been involved in corruption, helped cause losses of Venezuela's foreign assets, the theft, in particular, of the US-based oil refiner Sitco and chemical company Monomeros in Colombia. Um, two, she was involved in the corruption plot or orchestrated by the usurper Juan Guaido. That also contributed to the loss of gold reserves in the Bank of England, for example which led to a criminal blockade of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, as well as the shameless dispossession of the companies and wealth of the Venezuelan people abroad with the complicity of corrupt governments. That also, of course, damaged the currency externally. She'd been also an appointed Panamanian diplomat, which is prohibited under Articles 149, 191 of the Constitution. In many other countries, she'd be serving very long prison sentences, including the US, where there is for that sort of thing for um, uh, Anyone who is a U.S. citizen who levies war against them or adheres to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort, is guilty of treason, shall suffer death or be in prison not less than five years and fined <clears throat> not less than $10,000 and shall be incapable of holding any office under the United States. That's how they deal with it under U.S. law, for example. The fifth myth is about the economy. Didn't Chavismo ruin the country's economy? You see a lot of this, of course, in the U.S. media. It's true that after the death of Chavez in 2000 and 13, many of the tremendous social gains were compromised, but that was mainly due to the economic warfare carried out against Venezuela by the Obama and Trump regimes. In 2015, Obama declared Venezuela a threat to US security, imposing a series of coercive measures on the country. To that, Trump added another 200 measures intended to bring Venezuela to its knees. The artificial proclamation of Juan Guaido as president 
uh, added device by which the Trump administration could steal billions of dollars, including gold reserves held by the Bank of England and the entire Citgo petroleum business. In 2021, UN rapporteur Alina Duhan reported on the dr dr drastic social impact of Washington's unilateral coercive measures, illegal under international law. Those wide-reaching sanctions against Venezuela had a devastating impact on the entire population's living conditions. Damage to the economy was the worst in 2019-2020 at the height of the Trump sanctions when oil exports fell to less than 1% of those in 2012. Salaries fell to very low levels with inflation and the devaluation of the currency. Yet by 2021, oil exports had resumed and inflation fell to very low levels fairly quickly, according to CEPAL. In 2022, Iran helped restart some of Venezuela's damaged refineries. Oil exports continued to grow through 2023 and this year. And with that growth and better management, the currency stabilized. Social investment remained very high, as much as 77% of the budget this year. By late 2023, President Maduro said there'd been some important achievements and renewed prosperity was on course for 2024. Underwritten by economic growth, social cohesion, popular participation, Community level education and health programs could advance. Better relations with neighboring Colombia helped stabilize security alongside support from other Latin American nations. By 2024, Maduro drove the public housing program into the construction of more than 5 million new homes. Social security was personalized into a homeland card, the Carne de la Patria, which is exercised through a phone app and guarantees food, fuel, and other subsidized goods and services. The opposition U.S. media called this an utterly evil instrument of repression, supposedly because it's surveillance potential. But that claim just confirms that their intention is to dismantle the foundation of Social Security. Um, other information sources reminded citizens that by the investment of increased oil exports, the government had stabilised the currency uh, for the first time in many years. Increased food production, um, and production in the agricultural sector is a uh, just the success of, of in recent times, really, Venezuela has been dependent on food imports for the previous century. Now it's basically feeding itself. Um, the the increased oil exports supported the social missions uh, and providing all of the free health consultations, 100 million free health consultations, getting rid of illiteracy and stimulating community projects and diverse small business. Uh, the population is aware of this. In the January 2024, poll showed 82% of Venezuelans saw things as getting better in 2024. And of course, that created a better climate for the elections this year and improved uh, Maduro's chances of re-election. On the other side, the opposition mostly relied on slogans of freedom, anti-Chavismo, masking the typical liberal plans to sell off the country's assets and dismantle social security. They couldn't say openly that they had a plan which promised structural adjustment with destroying the the, the 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 patria card and so on because that would be too alarming basically well in conclusion we have really another chapter in venezuelan history where the opposition is facing two choices to support national institutions as some of them have done or to remain part of this coup culture um five days after the election president maduro referred the opposition claims um, claims against the CNE, plus the complaints over hacking attacks on the CNE to the Supreme Court under a writ of umpero. So the Supreme Court in turn called on all candidates to present their data and their complaints, and nine out of ten did so, except Edmundo Gonzalez. Um, notwithstanding uh, Washington's attempt to declare Gonzalez as an elected president, in other words, appointed from outside, not through the, the country's institutions, uh, President Maduro's re-election seems quite secure. The CNE is behind him, the National Assembly is behind him, the military is behind him. There have mass, been mass rallies before, during and after the elections or before and after the elections in support of their institutions and their democracy. Contrary to the Western media, the pro-government rallies have been consistently much bigger than those of the US-backed opposition. So the, these pressures, though, from the US will continue to aggravate this ongoing split in opposition strategies. Do they either participate in national institutions uh, or abandon that for refuge in North American back coups? We've got some opposition leaders like Manuel Rosales, Enrique Capriles, who have been involved in the coup attempts in the past, but nevertheless have resumed their engagement in the political process. They failed in presidential campaigns, but both have also enjoyed successive terms as governors of the states of Zulia and Miranda, respectively. On the other side, we see the failed, fake, unelected President Juan Guaido sitting in Miami, the refuge of many extremist Latin American leaders. 
It seems Maria Corina Machado, Edmundo Gonzalez, if they're not arrested and jailed, will join Juan Guaido as cast off agents of coups on behalf of their masters in Washington. But there's a lesson for future Venezuelan politicians. Will they join national institutionality or simply become the latest creatures of the comprador coup culture? That's my concluding remarks.